invited Ratima to come back because, you know, the way things happen a lot of times when something happens that big and monumental in our life, sometimes we don't handle them the right way. And we're always taught in our community to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but that may not be the thing to do. So we invited Ratima and wanted her to sit in on the conversation. I want to tell y'all something that did happen, though. It's funny when uh, I told y'all Sali was the first one to to get to the site of where everything that had happened. And the funny thing about me was the thing that I thought about in my head was like, I wanted him to make sure that he knew that I was okay because of the things that I knew that he had already been through in the past with his family members and the stuff that he had just went through. So I first thing I told him was to come look at me. Like, I'm I'm here, I ain't going nowhere. Everything is cool, you know. It was it was crazy. What did what did you think when you when you saw that when you first got the call? All right, man. <clears throat> I didn't know it was as serious. You know what I'm saying? It was just like let me get there. Like it was like all right. So it's like you looking because I'm trying to see. I was on the freeway, so I'm trying to see like where can I get off it? You right. know what I mean? So we're just like just trying to get there. <clears throat> when I got there, it was just like once I saw you and we you looked at me, you was shook your head at me like yo, and you like looked at me. I was like, all right, cool. And then it was like I was able to try to start processing everything. And blood was everywhere. It was like I'm still bleeding. You know, it was it was it was it was crazy. But we when we got to the and I also want to say uh, I want to shout out Grady Trauma Center. I gotta honestly say that they were some of the coolest motherfuckers that I ever met in my life. All the people at Grady Trauma Center was. They were very supportive. We actually sent over some flowers. It was so much happening, even while we were in there. But the thing that I want to tell y'all about that was crazy to me, the MRI was probably even more traumatic than what happened to me because I had gone through a situation that I had never really gone through before. And to be in that machine with a cage over my face and I have to sit totally still for 35 minutes. And, um, you know, as I'm trying to find my connection with God and really think about life, because I, I even tell y'all one of the craziest things that happened to me, because my beliefs are a little bit different than everybody else's are, I never had to compartmentalize what I believe in now with death before. So it was my first opportunity of really seeing, do I really believe in what I think I believe in or would I revert back? Because as human beings... Question your own philosophy. Yeah. And, 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 am I right? White Jesus, white Jesus, get me out of here, white Jesus! <laughs> you can call the brown one. I swear one. I won't be white. You can call the brown one. cracker, no more. <laughs> Fuck Jesse Jackson. <laughs> I actually didn't think about the white Jesus one time. I, I, I can honestly, Dirt Bad Corey, I can, I can honestly say that. I, I, not one time, but what, what, what I will say is um, it was important, you know, for me, to be honest with all of you, I, I was thinking more about all of the people who were around me, and I had to keep calm because I knew if I freaked out, then everybody else around me would freak out. Would freak out. And I'll tell y'all something that was crazy. When I was um, in the ambulance, I asked the lady, I said, I, I, you don't have to answer this question if you, if you don't want to. I said, but if, you, I said, do you have children? She said, yes. I said, would you, would you want your daughter to call you now or after, you know, the doctor seeing you? And she said, to be honest with you, I would say after. She said, because if you call your mom now, you might not be able to talk to your mom for another, in, a, in our case, another five, six hours. And to have that ambiguity and, um, and that much time, because, you know, we are always going to think the worst. So, right, I didn't tell my mom, I didn't talk to my mom until after we were in the hospital and, you know, everything has sort of smoothed out. But I definitely say it was life-changing and... The other thing, too, was that, you know, while, while we were there, you know, to not know if the things that could happen later, because they were talking about, like, you know, with my spine and with my brain and 
all of these types Enough of different damage things. There already. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to not know, you know, and have to sit there for three or four hours until all those results come back. And we also don't think about the effect that, you know, the loss of any of our lives, would it have the effect that it'll have on everybody else and their livelihoods and the things that they're doing for the rest of their life. I'll tell y'all something that was, was even more powerful, um, and then we'll come back to this, is that my closest friends came over um, the next day and everybody surrounded me. It, was, it felt like how when, you know, back in Mississippi when or in Florida or where the places that we're from, we would go over grandmother's houses on Sunday. Like everybody just got uh, around me. And the crazy thing that I say, you know, Regina came through and I could tell when I was on the phone, it wasn't me telling Regina that I was all right. Regina had to come and see me. So I didn't even say like, no, nah. I was like, come on. Because she was like, I need to see your face. Sally hadn't left me since that happened. Like, I was like, bro, you can go home. You know, nah, I'm, I'm staying right here. So, like, he been at the house uh, uh, from the time that he was next to the ambulance until we shooting the podcast today. Like, he been right there. Scott flew right into town, and he was dealing with the, my, he was dealing with the loss of, you know, a father figure in his life. You know, one of the closest people in his life, and I didn't even put that together. So just to compound things of what all of us have been going through on top of this, because like I, like I told y'all, you know, when I was in the hospital and I was looking at Salih, that was the main thing that I thought about. I know what he'd been through with his older brother. And I know I'm like an older brother to him. So I didn't even want him to be thinking in his mind that there's a possibility that he could lose his new big brother. You know, and that took away a lot of my fear because I was concentrating on him. You know, it was just crazy. For Tima, the um, thing that I, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you in is because, like, one of the things that came across to me was just how much the smaller things in life didn't matter. You know, just to be able to breathe and, you know, have my limbs and my eyes you know, to be able to call the people that I care about and, and for me to be here. Because from that day, I started thinking about the fact that I could not be here, like right now, like and how the scope of that, you know, would have would have changed. You begin yeah. to associate life with your mortality at this yeah. point. Yeah, and everything that I've ever done, it, it gave it another level of focus for me. It's funny, I was I still hadn't taken this off. I told I told Lee that um I was going to get it made. I was going to get an exact duplicate made in gold. I'll tell y'all one other thing that happened, and this is really strange. Um, when my grandmother was living, my, my grandmother's been dead about eight years now. My grandmother was, you know, she from Mississippi. She was, I wouldn't say she was a hoarder, but my grandmother... <laughs> <laughs> what? Why you laugh? That's not the word I thought was about to come out. No, <laughs> what, what you thought I was going to say? Oh, no. Continue with the story. Uh, so. Not a hoarder, but give me another he word. Said it. Before he got correct. to the correct, the dirt, finishing the dirt, the dirt, dirt. Oh, me the out. <laughs> You're like, dang. Oh, wow. Like, what in okay, the hell? hell Y'all nah. really be talking I about a bus. Now we're going here. I got <laughs> terrified, Corey. No. Hurry up and delete that shit. <laughs> no, but my um, my grandmother used to always just keep. She was a collector. She, yeah, she was a collector. All right, Corey. She was a collector. And um, <laughs> so nice. So I knew, I knew when I gave my grandmother this watch that I would have to take the watch that she had on, or she would take the new watch and put it up, and she would never wear it. So I made, I literally took, took a, made her take the watch off, and I put the new watch on her. And I, I kept that watch. And it was crazy. Five years after she died, uh, I found the watch, I pulled it out, and it was still ticking. And slowly after that, like probably about a couple of months after that, it stopped ticking. And when I saw that watch, it just reminded me that she's here with me. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that it was still ticking five years after she had died and nobody had touched the watch until I had found it again. Uh, I wear that watch maybe two, three times a year. That night I pulled that watch out and I had that watch on. And it's funny because um, it was blood all over the watch. It's still my blood all over the watch and I won't wipe it off. I'm going to leave it exactly like that as a, as a reminder. I, I had a real bad car accident in college. Uh, almost ripped my left hand off. I still don't have feeling in these three fingers, and it's been since 1991, maybe. 
can't bend my wrist. A lot of shit happened. Uh, I went in, broke my arm in a car accident. I went into the hospital. The doctor said, I can't set this bone. We have to operate on you. And I basically woke up like nine days later in the ICU. So what happened was I'm allergic to anesthesia, so my lungs collapsed during the surgery. And I was telling Sali, I woke up about three days later and I had a tube down my throat and couldn't close my mouth, and I started fighting trying to get loose. So they put me to sleep again. I woke up a couple of days after that, and my parents were standing over me. I didn't know if I was fucking dead. I thought I was looking at the casket. Because, <laughs> like, days had passed, and it just seemed like a minute. You know what I'm saying? But um, i tell you what happened to me. When I was coming home from the hospital, I had pins and screws all hanging out of my arm. Uh, I had a big hole in my temple where I'd hit the windshield. And um, my girlfriend at the time, we had to stop at an ATM to get some money to go get something to eat. And I was, you know, I was heavy into martial arts at that time, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to compete anymore. I didn't know. To me, at that moment, my life was like over. And I saw a man come out that bank, and he only had one arm. I don't know how he lost his other arm, but he only had one arm. And right then, I sat up in that car seat, and I said, this isn't going to be your downfall, man. You got to level up after this. So I was telling Sali, I started back in the dojo literally a week later, teaching five, six classes a week, and I actually taught myself how to fight to where my weak hand became my strongest hand. So I kind of, if it wasn't for me almost losing my life that night, you probably wouldn't even know me because that set me on the path of studying martial arts and boxing to an addict addiction level. And that's what led me to be doing security and all the stuff I do now. It's funny, me and Lee set back almost to a mathematics level. Three seconds later, three seconds earlier, it wouldn't have it either wouldn't have happened at all or it would have been fatal. It happened for a reason. So like from the moment that it happened, I started trying to figure out like what is the message. You well, know? sometimes you won't see it. You don't know where this where things lead you until you get down the road and look back and say, oh, that's why. It's like a relationship. When a relationship first goes bad, you'd be like, damn, I thought this was the one. Then you look at that chick eight years later and like, thank God I got out of that when I did. So you just, a lot of times you won't know. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time racking your brain as to why things happen. It's all about how you react. My, to me, the most important thing to focus on is what do we do from here? Because it's all about how you build from this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know if, <clears throat> excuse my voice, but I don't know if you believe when people have talked about having a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Many people associated with trauma have talked about having a, a near-death experience. And that several things have happened. That for those who have love, support, and someone that they need to live for, mm -hmm. they oftentimes say that there are faces that flash to them. They may be someone that's alive, or it may be someone that, has gone on to another life, but that there was something speaking to them, reaching to them, a light. And, you know, this may feel spooky to someone, but mm -hmm. I've had an experience similar. Mm -hmm. And that that was the reason for them to say, I'm not going to lay here and die. And they live because there was something saying that life is not over yet. Yet we don't know what that journey is. But from everything that you're saying, it doesn't sound like this is a whole different, this is a catalyst for something different now. Now, do you, you know what that is right now is one thing. But one of the things that you said, all I could think about, it wasn't anything selfless. You didn't say anything about, it was, I was thinking about Sali. I was thinking about Scott. I was thinking about everyone who was counting on me. The thing that I, um, the thing that I was the most proud of, I think, is just that we all stay calm. You know, and I can honestly say that I, it would have probably been a little bit worse if I wouldn't have so many people around me. But I knew that if, if I freaked out or if I acted a certain kind of way, then it would bleed out into the world. You know what I'm Correct. saying? So, and my dad taught me that. My and dad, you were also in shock. We need to look at it from a medical perspective yeah. that you were actually medically in shock. Yeah. And, um, and was, so your body prepares itself mm -hmm. in a certain way, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that... that First thing I did is to make sure that everything on me was was okay. My um my dad always told me that you stay in control because when you lose control then the world controls you and the situations control you and and not the other way around. What what I'll tell you is that more than anything is that 
that silent time that you have when your mind starts beating up on you, I ne- I still haven't had that yet. Like, they stayed around me and wouldn't let me get by myself. And as crazy as things were, the day after probably was one of the best times that I've ever had in my life because Edward came down. Edward just got his doctorate. So he had been working and working. As soon as I called him, he got on the road and came, and he said, like, what we didn't, Edward didn't leave until about, what, 11, 10, 11 that night? Yeah, something like that. Like, we, it was funny because um, the doctors had actually told me to, you know, to move around a little bit so that my body wouldn't lock up. So we we slowly walked around the neighborhood. It was funny that we, we realized that you really don't see grown black men. I, I didn't want to say that. It's probably look real interesting. Y'all yeah, yeah, black ass. Y'all big black right. ass is walking in your rich see, ass neighborhood. Yo, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that's that though. That's, like, that's a good way to That's what I was thinking. That's a good way to That's what I was thinking. It's the same neighborhood where they called the police when he was jogging. Yeah, so we were mm-hmm. um, like we were walking around together and we was just talking about that. Like our people were looking out there. The windows. You all ain't got these niggas all together. And um, but like nah, we cooked, they, 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 we cooked and sat around and laughed and talked and um, you know they 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 stayed around me and I, I still hadn't had that that moment besides the MRI um, time. But like I say, I'm 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 grateful. And the other thing that I realized, I think what bothered me initially is that the stereotypical people that you thought would have been there, those were not the people who came through. I called um, Mr. Moody and Mrs. Moody. It was funny because they told me to stop doing this, but, like, the thing that ran in my mind is I didn't want... Everybody else has their responsibilities and their families, and to a certain degree, you feel like you borrowed, and you don't want to put your problems on them. So even though... I knew they would have got up. I knew that they would have been there. I didn't want to. I didn't want to feel in my head that I was a burden to nobody, even though it was that traumatic. And but they th- can't do anything anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'd be thinking. If you come up here, what are you gonna do? You're not a trauma surgeon. You know what I'm saying? So get a good night's rest. I agree. That's, that's <laughs> literally the way I think. Like, what are you gonna just come up here and look at me? You fucked yeah. up. Yeah, I'm fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> 3 a.m. <laughs> but you called and you let, now, go you get let them out know, dude. though, right? Yeah, yeah. no, no, no. I called and they talked me. They, they talked me. They, 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 they. They called Corey. They, 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 <laughs> engineer. They, they. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Damn, Scott. Stop. Stop. Oh, stop. Damn, stop it. I'm, that's just how I am. Like, what is he really going to fucking do? Yeah. Am I going to call this motherfucker? You be rapping and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck out of here. He'll make a video. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I see you Tuesday, nigga. <laughs> I can't. I cannot. <laughs> but um, no, nah, seriously though, I um so I talked to him and Miss Moody is a nurse. So she was just telling me all the things to do and not to do until, you know, everything got under uh under wraps. And, you know, I I I also knew how they feel about me too. So I had to make sure that they knew that they, you know, that I was cool and that I was all right. That 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 was that. But um, the one thing that I I do want to say just just for me to you all, the people that are listening, one of the things that I thought about, and I don't know why this came, just popped in my head, but I thought about how we look at entertainers and how we look at rappers and we look at basketball players and football players and and how mentally people put themselves on pedestals. For shit that don't matter at all. Change your perspective. Like, yeah, you know, like you, really you bounce a fucking basketball. It's like, a game. In, it's in, a dope in, ass game, but it's a game. In the in the, in the scheme of life and the universe and and shit that really matters, feeding people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. That shit means nothing. But people are, are walk around Earth looking down and spitting on people because of a concept that America deems important that really like when when I down this earth, I, I said it in a verse and nobody ever talked to me about it. I was like, you know, when I die, I don't want to be known for just play. I don't want to die and just be known for like a pimp. I want them things to be the furthest away from people's mind. I, 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 I want it to be integrity. Like, to be honest with y'all, like, 
like I said, I got a concussion now. And everybody was surprised that I was going I came and shot the podcast. Well, that's because we have a responsibility to each other. And if I got to crawl in this motherfucker and y'all hold me up, as long as I'm here smiling and y'all handle the business, like, I believe that's what li- life and living is for, is for us to be here. And um, I love y'all all. Like, I, I told Sally this a couple couple weeks ago that we building a, a mafia in a good way. And when I meant that is because this is bigger than money for me with y'all. You know, this is... is, is Corey, all of us, I told you, like, you you in whether you like it or not. I tell you what um, uh, what Bob Dylan family told me when I ate at Thanksgiving with them one time. It was like, wash the dishes, nigga. <laughs> 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 Scott, stop it. <laughs> Scott is on one today. <laughs> <laughs> and he's laughing so hard at his fucking joke. What the fuck? Motherfucker, you was at Bob Dillon's house. Like, wash the dishes, motherfucker. Black motherfucker. You think you just came from fellowship? Play in the butler, right? Belvedere, get your ass. Get these biscuits off the table. Uh, I cannot. I'm I'm sorry. What did he say? Oh, shit. See, when you've been through traumatic events, it makes traumatic events less traumatic. So I've been through near death experiences many times. And you've been through kiss so, Exactly. And cooning. So, yeah. <laughs> I just kind of, everybody processes trauma differently. Oh, I happen to do mine through dark comedy. Very, very, very I'm dark sorry. comedy. <laughs> No, but and these motherfuckers <laughs> acting like they got better morals than me. Fuck all y'all. Nah. <laughs> okay? You the you, worst. You're no, one of the worst you, people I've ever you, fucking met. Listen, <laughs> you by far went the worst yesterday. Oh, I fucked that. Oh, no. What you told me outside, which I would never repeat. Oh, that was bad. That was the worst. I've never heard anything But it came from an honest perspective. But that's Wait, Scott. God is a thing. Oh, but, but no, what they told me is that uh, it's hard. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but team, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't know. How do you come back from that? Ooh, huh? Scott is dance, a mess. Damn, nigga. <laughs> It's, 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 uh, so finish your story. You said you were watching dishes. You're going to be the you Indian. Too <laughs> <laughs> you the Indian at Thanksgiving dinner. Oh. <laughs> Bob Dylan tried to scalp you. <laughs> Steal your house. <laughs> Gave you small pops. <laughs> he said he let you sleep with that bad ass night, Scott. <laughs> Oh, you can give you the small box blanket. That's funny. That's fucking up. No wonder you moved me to another location. God damn. I cannot. No, well, damn, like no. <laughs> <laughs> He said that. Uh, no, they said that uh, oh, it's hard to get in the family, but it's impossible to get out. You know, and um, you know, we said that we were gonna create a a, a situation in a place where our people felt comfortable about talking about anything. And I talked to Curtis before we came in. It's like, do do we think that this is a good topic for us to talk about today? And Curtis said, hell yeah. He said, because so many people are going through things and they end up going through them by themselves. And when they see that, you know, David, like, you, you, you could have not been here. You know what I'm saying? And you still come out here and talk about it. And help people get through the things that they're going through. So hopefully, you know the, the you know the situation that I go through can can make sure that you know everybody knows that they're not the only one that's going through stuff. You know, um, go ahead, Scott. Did you thank Cracker at any point when you were at Thanksgiving dinner with Bob Dylan's family? Actually, I didn't. But I tell you, I I tell you what was funny though. How you think they was calling you a nigga when you went to the bathroom? No, what what I was thinking about <laughs> is just not gonna stop. When I, I had was, an uncle, right? Let's uh, just out, Corey. I had an uncle that was dating a um a Japanese lady, uh-huh. and she took him to Japan to meet her family. Right. And he said when uh when they got to the family home, the parents greeted him very nicely. Mm-hmm. Then they asked the girl to come in the back. And he said all he could hear in the back was a bunch of yelling in Japanese language and one. English term. What, nigga? 
I don't know, man. This, this is a true story. <laughs> I tell y'all what I was thinking about, though. So when we were see, in, everybody feels better. When we were when we when we were in the emergency room, I did think about this. I can say this that so you had all of these white folks that was taking care of me, right? And so they were they were like uh, one was like it. one like said one came in and say, "Hey, they said that you got a million views on YouTube," and then I was like. Uh, I was like, actually, that's true. And they was like, we know. We back there Googling you. So I was thinking about if they pulled up the they David Better up podcast. The <laughs> <laughs> and they, and the they just come in there yes. and start dropping yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. Come in there like, hold on, we got one more shot. Yeah. Hook him up to the special IV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go get the black bag. Yeah, like, yeah, like hit Mr. Banner, we got yeah. some. It's a vitamin. We got some water yeah. for you. Right. <laughs> The lace with apple it. juice. That's hilarious. Grape swisher vitamins. This is one of the things that I was concerned about, though, is just the fallout of how you you think about stuff later on, especially when you know other things and other people are involved. Like how you know, I, I was just worried about how you think about you know, because usually when like right now everybody's around, right now it's, it's still fresh and it's new. Um, like when everybody start going home, dude, have you noticed that like, you know, there's some things that people have to deal with then? That's what I was trying to prepare myself for. Um, but like like when So you gotta take a self assessment, man. When it when, when and the I smoke clears. Yeah, and I don't think you've had self- enough time. Yeah. Like it's gotta stand to really sit back to realize some of the things that um have developed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a mental block. Right. It's something you can conquer. I want you to know that. So even though it may surface, you were able to to conquer that. And I, I'll tell you something else that um, and I wasn't gonna say this initially, but one of the things that I felt bad about is that for the most part I was calm. And like I said, the MRI was the thing that freaked me out the most. I I sort of felt bad for not feeling the things that other people felt. You know, you hear all these things that people go through when they have near-death situations. Once I knew that my limbs were straight and I knew that I was physically all right, I was grateful. That was going to be my statement. I was like, what's wrong with being grateful? What are the things that you're saying that other people do that is not relatable to you? Well, like You're being uh, grateful. The fear and... All of that kind of stuff, I didn't, I did, I felt focused, like more focused. Like that's what I, what I felt. Because you're more in tune with yourself. Yeah. Like, so I was like, I didn't, and I wanted to, I, I didn't, I didn't want to feel like I wasn't, you know, especially grateful to the most high. But once I knew everything was all right, it was about everybody else and, and not about me. Is that strange? That's not strange for you. That mm. may be strange for others. Some people, on the other hand, though, may lead toward, I'm going to do everything in life because I couldn't have been here. (laughs) They may do it for someone else, or they may just get completely self-indulgent, and everything is about them. Right. Is that what you're saying that you want to experience? No, I I don't. I'm fine with where I am. The biggest thing that I I didn't want to do is I know that I already have tendencies um, that lean towards depression. So I said to myself immediately, I'm not going down any of those roads. Like I told Sali that I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna allow this to take me because we're at the cusp of doing some very big things. Now, what I did think though, that this is an opportunity for me to get back focused and get back on my dean. But for for me to and for me and to me, it was once I knew I was oh like generally. Because I, I had a lot of problems. But for me, the, I, I tell people this all the time. Like, the things that are wrong with me, I could have not been here at all. So all Absolutely. of that stuff is small it's my new. to me. You're you know? not sweating the small stuff. Right. And, um, yeah, I'm just grateful. Uh, what I say? It'd be crazy because it'd be like, when did, like so much stuff that happened to me in my life. And you'd be like, you don't be realizing, like, when you hang up the phone with somebody... 
or you just seen them or you yes. just was with yeah. them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like you take for granted that that the way stuff how life changed so fast and stuff mm-hmm. going that could have been like the last time you talked mm-hmm. to somebody and you don't even really be thinking nothing of it and it's just like man it'd be crazy because even like that and I don't know, man it just be like it'd be wild man you know get... say it so we can talk about nah, it nah cause yeah. it's like just like even with my nephew like right before that happened we was just talking and I told him like man be safe man be mm-hmm. cool and then a week later that happened mm-hmm. and it was like even with this with you I just was with you all day and and that was one of the things that I thought about. I said, I know little bro, I don't even want it to get in his head for him to think, well, he just left me. I got something. Nah, it, life don't work like that. You know what I mean? You all right. We cool. That don't matter. One thing that I will talk about that after all of this is over and I'm able to talk about the whole situation, there is something specifically, and we we all sat down and talked about this. There was something specifically that I had received about a month earlier that was one of the catalysts of me still being here. And it showed me, we can actually, we sat back and said, like, okay, that's why this happened. And it showed me that it was divine. And the, the person that, that found me, the first thing that he said to me is that you're supposed to be here. Because he saw everything that had happened, and he was like, you supposed to be here. That's the exact thing that he told me. was the first thing that he said to me when he found me was, you are supposed to be here. I saw it. That was amazing. And so, like, for, for, for me, that just let, lets us know that, you know, we are here for a purpose, and we got to get to it. And the last thing Curtis said when he walked out, you know, he said people tell him all the time, it's great to see you. And he says every time, like, it's great to be seen. Like, it, it was even hard for me to come up with a topic for today's podcast because, to be honest with you, anything less than this at this time really is really sort of minute right now. You know, go ahead. <clears throat> I just wonder if we think about, um, you kind of mentioned, the people that you thought would be here were not the ones who were necessarily supportive, and the ones here were amazing. Mm-hmm. But also how the entertainment world um, walks away and contingent upon what happens. Mm-hmm. We get paralyzed or we something, and they forget about us. Yeah. And so I think it's important for us to reflect on that we're just human. And like you said, in sometimes, my opinion, <clears throat> we get bigger than life. Right. And you don't have that attitude. You're just so humble yeah. about who you are. And sometimes something like this brings us back down to earth to just say, I bleed like everyone else. Right. I live and I die like everyone else. And it just changes our mindset of who I am or how I've been blessed right. and grounds us. But you've always been grounded yeah. from the person that I've met. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I think that comes from being from Mississippi and watching how people always looked at Mississippi and how we are even treated in the microcosm that's called the South. Like, we are even looked down or frowned upon about even the Florida people looks who... down at Mississippi. That's hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for me, it's, it's... I always said I never wanted anybody to feel the way that people tried to make me feel. And I always thought that we as Southerners, we were too nice. That was one of the reasons why I took the aggressive stance that I took as David Banner because I think you know we always let people come in we here here's the table open arms and then people take our shit and then shit on us and I I never liked that I always been aggressive about life you know I told somebody when um I went to Africa um people always ask me like you know what was the epiphany that you had I said I didn't have an epiphany I said my trip to Africa showed me that I was on the right path because I was already enlightened, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, for, for me in, in this experience, the thing that I want people to take away, man, is, is you only have one of everything that's important to you, and that's usually free. You know, you have one right leg, one left leg. Um, I'm actually... Um, one third. <laughs> I knew you was going to say that. Um, and something that I also realized going through this is, like, a lot of times we'll complain about the people that we don't have, but we're not grateful for the people that are there. Some people don't have a motherfucking person at all. You know, that was one of the things that, you know, Scott told me. Like, he said, bro, don't... Sitting around here complaining, you got five people that got your back unconditionally. Yeah. You're around here complaining? Yeah. 
And some people Fuck out here. some some people don't have nobody at all. You know, and and I'm 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 grateful for for everybody that I have in my life and and the fact that we not only, you know, live, um breathe, party, we make money together and we watch after each other. Cuz I I even I thought about this. All of us anytime and anything happens, we always get around each other. Something. man? Well, you do. You you just don't say no, nothing. Y'all don't you come get around, around me. You don't ever let nobody know you nothing. You be in the fucking besides, woods. Yeah. Beside the point. You be in the Yo, woods. How how do we know? You you when you happy you when you happy you look mad. When you mad you look mad. It's just my resting face. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If I walk around fucking smiling all the time. Hey. Oh, then people will see your. Uh, we need to see your uh, rose. See this two piece, <laughs> two piece rose slug. And still shining. Shout out to Scotty ATL. <laughs> But yeah, like it's so. I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful, and I hope that you know some kind of way this, this could help. Is is there anything that you would would like to tell people who who go through, um, you know, near death experiences? Is there anything to watch for? Anything that they should look out for? I know therapy is really important, but you know, is there any advice that you would give? Don't ignore some of the signs that seem unusual. Because mm-hmm. when we talk about a near-death experience, you feel fearful that you're going crazy. Mm-hmm. We aren't in control of some of the things that happen in our life. And so we have to render that so that we could survive and stand up and fight and continue to live, no matter what the outcome, when we have these, these traumatic events that happen in our life. Um, so I would say listen to... Listen to those around you first who say, go seek help. Mm -hmm. And help comes in different arenas. Mm -hmm. Therapy is one that I'm always going to advocate. Medical treatment is is very important. And again, like usual, when we're talking about black folks, you know we don't want to go to the doctor. We don't trust them. We don't believe them. And we think seven months later that our body is fine Mm -hmm. um, and actually something Mm -hmm. could possibly be wrong. Just as disease plagues our body, we need to go and get that checked out. Yeah, it's crazy because like even even with me, we always have a tendency to thinking that we we okay. We all right. I'm all right. Yeah. You know, and um, no, I, man, I'm glad and I'm glad that I listened. But I think that's about it. Um, well, can we say happy Kwanzaa to everyone? Yeah, we actually can. Kabaragani. <laughs> Kwanzaa is a. African American mm-hmm. <clears throat> holiday in the spirit of people of the African diaspora and, and African American folks. And mm-hmm. the concept was that Christmas it could become so commercialized mm-hmm. that we forgot to connect to our own roots, which was the things that we were talking about here, seven <laughs> principles of Kwanzaa. Mm-hmm. And from December 26th and for the next seven days, we acknowledge different principles that connect us to our own roots, that we are people of community, that we relate through community, not self, we relate to our culture, and our culture connects us. I actually went to a Kwanzaa ceremony years ago, and there were exotic dancers at that. Exotic? Mm-hmm. It was on the purpose, Nia. That day? And that, and that, and that was the purpose. That was yesterday. Nia is purpose, purpose yeah. and self-determination. So it was in Atlanta, obviously, <laughs> you know, world capital of strippers. And we went to this house party that was a Kwanzaa ceremony. It was really the Kwanzaa ceremony? It was, I'm serious. There were the candles and everybody said Habargani, Nia, you Nia. know. And then... <laughs> I can't. I cannot. This one has had two so, Collective this... economics, though. You said it was dancers there. One of the... She raises a valid point. Collective so, economics. So we were she, supporting. So did she have on... Uh, <laughs> did she have on the dashiki? No, they had traditional uh, Christmas colors on, honestly. They had on red and white, and, you know, Santa hats. But Look, they. Wait a minute. For, for Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa? They weren't part of the ceremony. Was it Christmas? It was a. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, just saying. You just said you went to a Kwanzaa celebration. I did. And once the candles were Established lit. Established and- by a <laughs> black freedom fighter. Yes. Who didn't believe in Correct. the commercialism. Right. Obviously, the strippers Obviously didn't believe in, in Christmas I- and, and Kwanzaa either. They were more traditional white Jesus Christians, so they came down and they read Santa and, and let us have it. it were they um, full nudity. white? Dancers were white? No, they were black. Well, I don't know what you said. No, but, 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 but so they didn't even have on the red, no, white, and blue for long. I don't think that they knew they were coming to a Kwanzaa ceremony. They were just working. Oh. 
I'm just telling you what happened. I'm done. I'm done. No, I'm so done. Well, with that, we're going to go Atlanta, to... Atlanta could be an interesting place. <laughs> with the, slash strippers. What do you want me to do? With that, we're going to go to our elders. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just going to ask, to ask everyone out there to just think we about that old stripper self-determination that we are going to leave here with, with the thought of self-determination. I borrowed Gunny. Which day of Quam is it today, though, before we go? I want to believe it's Kumba. Or it's our sixth day, but it's, it's Kumba, I want to say. Because yeah. I have to go through my... My principles. And thank you. But today uh, is the sixth. I know you were on your way out of town, and um, you you um, switched around your schedule to make sure that you did, that you were there. I just like to to make sure that that we have people because a lot of times, like I told you before, so many people advise our people, and the internet has no way of checking anybody's credentials. So you got everybody giving all of this advice, and our people are all over the place and, and dealing with things that have to do with the mind. You you we have to start dealing with people who are qualified to giving our people certain messages. And we appreciate you and we thank you. And um if there's any way that we could ever be of service, um we're always here for you and we love you. And make sure you get where you're going safely and um thank you. And a word from our elders. Peace, family. This is Tony Browder. You know, as we stand on the threshold of a new year and a new decade, let us be mindful of who we are and what we will carry with us into this new future. We are the living embodiment of all of the ancestors who have preceded us. We carry within our bodies, within our DNA, the collective memory of all all of the power associated with it in all of the ancestors of human history. Black people, African people, contain the largest genetic memory of any human beings on the planet. And when we know who we are and act on that knowledge by inviting our ancestors to be present within our consciousness and live our lives with that understanding, we create the means by which those ancestors will inspire us and allow us their genius and allow their genius to shine through us in all we do. This is the beauty. This is the glory. This is the truth of who we really are. And this is the potential that exists within every single one of us. So my request to you is that you embrace yourself as the living manifestation of the best that humanity has to offer and to use your time, your talent, and your treasure to transform your consciousness, to transform your community, and to help every black life that matters to you. Our future has always been in our hands. And when we know that and act on that knowledge collectively, nobody and nothing can hold us back. My wish for you, my desire for you, is the best that life has to offer and that you bring forth that best in everything you do and all of your interactions with everyone. Peace.